Well, thanks for being on the podcast, Joel. I'm excited to talk to you today. Um, for everybody who's tuning in, you're listening to Stories for Earth, which is a cl- podcast about everything climate change and pop culture. Today, I am joined by Joel Burkett, who is an author of environmental legal thrillers. So, Joel, thank you for being on the show today. It's my pleasure. Happy to be here, Forrest. Cool. Well, first, let's start out just by telling us a little bit about yourself. Um, how did you become a writer and what is an environmental legal thriller? That's a great question. Um, I, uh, I guess I always wrote. Uh, as long as I can remember, I was always writing and uh, took some courses in writing uh, my first year or two at college. Hmm. And then uh, I became in, interested in environmental law and started taking more and more environmental sciences courses and eventually went on to become an environmental lawyer. And I was really so busy with my practice, I didn't have time for writing anymore. And I just put that aside for literally years, years and years. Mm -hmm. Um, Finally, um, probably about uh, 25 years ago, I started writing again. And I wrote a a short story that was accepted in our local uh, Harrisburg magazine and uh, continued writing, dabbling really in it. Uh, Probably about 13 or 14 years ago, though, I started getting serious about writing. And uh, unless you go off and get a, a, an MFA or get a BFA and really train to be a writer, uh, you, you do what I did, which is a lot of on the job training. Yeah. So I, I, I really did, you know, just on the job training. I took a lot. Of, I mean, I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote, probably have written at this point, I don't know, 30 or 35 short stories. And wow. I've completed six novels. And uh, although this is my second one to be published sure. and um, it's a, uh, I mean, I took classes, lots of classes, both uh, in-person and virtual classes. I joined a couple of organizations, and um, it's really just a question of write, write, write. And that's how I became a, uh, that's how I became a writer. Now, as your other question Mm -hmm. about um, environmental legal thrillers, uh, I'm an environmental lawyer. I've been interested in environmental issues for as long as I can remember. And so when I started uh, getting serious about writing novels, it seemed natural to me to write about environmental issues. I happen to like legal thrillers. Mm -hmm. So uh, I noticed that there weren't very many environmental legal thrillers out there. So I I decided to fill the void and uh, I've been, I've now finished my second one and I've got a third one that's ready to come out too. Cool. Sounds like you're very prolific, six novels and you said over 30 short stories. Yes, that's, that's over, um, probably about a 13 or 14 year period. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's like anything else, you, you sort of learn how to, um, you know, what the techniques are. And um, uh, if the story, if the story really, really wants to come out, it, it's actually a very easy thing for me anyway, and for other writers mm-hmm. to write it. I mean, if you're struggling with a story, it can take a very long time for it to come out. Or if you're sure. very fussy and a perfectionist, it can take a long time for <laughs> it to come out. I'm not yeah. saying that my stories aren't you know, well-written, I think they are. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I I I try not to let, you know, my desire for perfection get in the way with getting the words down on paper. But yeah, yeah, I guess guess I'm pretty prolific, but uh, (laughs) this is is just my second novel coming out. Sure. Yeah, I am a writer myself too. So I definitely know what you're talking about when you're talking about perfectionism, because that is one of my big hurdles with writing short stories as well. So yeah, it is uh, definitely kind of a daily practice or a ritual. I think I've heard some people call it. So yeah, it's getting words down on paper is what's important. You can always revise later. And as I've heard it before, also writing is revising. So. Right. I mean, Anne Lamott, who's a great writer and uh, teacher Mm -hmm. has specifically talked about that and says that uh, perfectionism is the, uh, basically the death of writing. So Mm -hmm. she uh, very much urges people to just get your words down on paper. That's good. That's good. Cool. Well, it's interesting to hear how your background as an environmental lawyer has uh, had an impact on what kind of stories you write. But also, um, I read this New York Times opinion piece about you before our interview, uh, which was an opinion piece about um, blind authors. And uh, I think the interview was from July of 2019, which I almost said July of last year. It seems crazy that time has gone by that quickly. So I wanted to ask you, In what ways has becoming legally blind affected you as a writer or has it affected you? It has affected me, uh, both good and bad. Um, The uh, I have a condition 
uh, which has a very long name. It's non-arteritic <laughs> anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. That is long. And you know, if a condition has more than two words in it, it's, it's not a good thing. Right. And so what it is basically is if you can picture your eyeball and this is the front of your eye and the back of your eye, you've got the optic nerve that connects your mm -hmm. eyeball to your brain. Sure. So that's that string thing that, that you've seen pictures of. Right. And in my case, I had um, blood clots in the back mm. of my eyeball, right in front of the optic nerve. Think of okay. the optic nerve, nerve is like a, um, a fiber optic cable with yeah. millions of, of, of nerve fibers going through it. So mm -hmm. when you get a uh, blood clot in front of those nerve fibers, it kills them off. And yeah. as a result of that, it uh, diminishes and it can even eliminate your vision. Mm -hmm. uh, my vision is bad enough that I'm legally blind. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't drive and I can't do a lot of things. I can't read paper, really. I have a really hard time reading paper. I can, okay. I can if, I, if I struggle, I can read paper. Um, but And there are a lot of other things that I, I just physically can't do anymore. One of the strange sure. things is if somebody is more than about 10 feet away from me, I can't see their face, which is a mm -hmm. very, very bizarre thing. It's it's, uh, it's it's very weird not to be able to see faces at about 10 I'm sure. feet. But um, in terms of my writing, um, I, I, I'm using right now, you can't see it, but I'm using right now a yard wide, ultra high definition monitor. Okay. And that helps a lot. I blow the uh, font up very large so I can mm -hmm. read it. And fortunately for me, I'm able to see um, a screen. So I can read a screen, okay. although I can't read paper. And um, mm. You know, the, the good news and the bad news is as a result of my uh, disability, I had to stop working. It was, you know, I was okay. at a point in my career and in my life that uh, learning how to continue being a lawyer without the ability to do many of the things that I'd been able to do before, mm -hmm. it's probably going to take me a couple of years. And at the same time, I was a couple of years away from retirement. Sure. So I uh, chose to go on disability and retire. So I did retire uh, from the practice of law uh, about a month or two after I was afflicted with this. Okay. And um, so now I'm able to write full time. I do use mm -hmm. um, dictation software. I use Dragon dictation software and that speeds things up for me a lot. I was never a good typist to start with, truth be told, <laughs> but the, the Dragon uh, software really does help a lot. That's so good. It, it's it's impacted me. Uh, it's made me a little less mobile. I mean, certainly the um, COVID has made everybody less mobile, mm -hmm. uh, but it really has impacted my ability to get around and not being able to drive is a gigantic pain. And uh, yeah. Uber and Lyft and all of that is, is good, but it's not quite the same thing as being able to jump into your own car and of course. go somewhere. So yeah, it really does have, have an impact on me. And it was very nice of uh, Frank Bruni mm -hmm. to write that nice uh, piece on me. It really did uh, get my name out and about. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's an interesting story, perhaps for another time, as to how I got <laughs> connected with probably the leading um, New York Times editorial columnist. But mm -hmm. uh, that was a... Um, that was just a fortuitous turn of events. Cool. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed that article and it was eye opening for me. And um, I don't know, I never thought about a lot of things that it touched on. And I thought it was really interesting the way that he approached that. So um, I'm glad that you were able to have that opportunity and connect with Frank. So that's cool. Um, right now I'm reading one of your novels, which is Amid Rage. Um, it follows a legal battle between a young attorney. I think he's probably about the same age as me actually uh <laughs> he's a young i think you say a dep lawyer uh named mike jacobs at least that's the way the antagonist pronounces it dep um dep -E 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 everybody else calls it okay only uh, only um ernie renati calls it dep okay. everybody else calls it dep yeah anytime ernie says it, i noticed every time that he says it there's always a note that says he pronounced it dep so i wondered if that was supposed to be kind of a derogatory way of saying it but um yeah, so the story follows Mike Jacobs, who, as I said, is this attorney for the DEP for Pennsylvania. And he's kind of in this um, legal battle with Ernie Renati, who is, I think, the CEO of a mining company called Rhino Mining, uh, and they're trying to build a they're trying to build a coal mining uh, or a coal mine, excuse me, uh, right in basically a residential area. Um, so I'm wondering. You know, you've worked for a very long time as an environmental lawyer. What was your inspiration for this novel? Does it have any kind of grounding in reality? I don't know if you're allowed to say that or not. <laughs> um, 
And is there any connection between it and some of your other polished novels? I think you have another book called Drink to Every Beast that might follow the same character. Yeah, um, the, um, let me start out by saying that everything that I've written is fiction. Okay. And um, so um, I know that people are going to read my stories and they're going to say, oh, I think I know this person, or I think I know yeah. this character, or I think I, I know, um, you know this, this case. And although they may be inspired by uh, fiction or by inspired by real, real life, mm -hmm. uh, they are fiction. I, okay. I attended a really good program uh, that John Grisham, the very famous yes. uh, thriller know. writer, wrote, uh, gave. And uh, Grisham said that he scours the legal journals and he scours newspapers for inspiration for his stories. And that's where mm. he gets the ideas for a lot of his stories. And I do basically the same thing. And I okay. also use uh, my experiences uh, even, even the use of the term debt. I had a client yeah. who used to refer, I, I couldn't figure out for the longest time what he was saying, because he was saying, <laughs> oh, Depp is doing this to me and Depp is, th and I'm thinking to myself, what the heck is he talking about? And then I realized yeah. he was, he was, he was putting the letters DEP together and referring to it as debt. Okay. Gotcha. Um, but, um, he's the only one I ever knew who did that, but I, I like that. And I just sort of tucked it away back here yeah. to use at a later point in time. So it is inspired by a lot of uh, real life situations. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, when I was at uh, DEP uh, a long time ago now, but when I was at DEP, I worked in the surface mining program, regulating mm -hmm. the industry. And uh, so there were a lot of, uh, of um, instances that, you know, in some small part, you know, impacted the way I wrote the story. Mm -hmm. Over the years, I've seen lots of things. I've been involved in lots of different kinds of situations. I've read lots of things. And all of those things have an impact. And of course, a lot of it is just plain fiction, just something that, that I've dreamed up. Just sure, to, sure. You know, it's just you know, pure fiction, not even to my knowledge, at least anyway, something that I was, you know, barring a little bit of this and a little bit of that from reality. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like when they say on TV that a program is ripped from the headlines and sometimes they are, and sometimes it's, it's really just a question of, um, you know, getting a little inspiration for something. Yeah. Yeah. And I, maybe I framed that question, uh, not quite how I intended, but I guess inspired by um, some things that happened to you is more of what I uh, meant, but yeah, I think that's, um that is something that writers in all genres kind of have to contend with a little bit. Um, especially I think in creative nonfiction, I've heard this come up a lot, you know, like people always want to ask, is this, you know, did this actually happen to you? Is this based on real events that happened in your life or is this, um, kind of purely fictional? And, um, and I think the answer that I hear a lot of times is, um, well, sometimes, you know, especially with creative nonfiction, it is something that actually happened, but in fiction, I mean, I feel like writers are always taking in inputs from their environment and they're kind of mashing that up in their brains to produce something that will make for an interesting story. So, yeah, I'm sure that you maybe had a, a slight advantage over people like John Grisham, unless he was a lawyer previously and I didn't know about it, but who lived through some of these experiences and you don't necessarily have to comb through legal journals, although I'm sure that might help a little bit too, but yeah. Well, I mean, Grish Grisham uh, was a uh, trial lawyer at one time in his okay. career and did uh, criminal law, but um, he's written three books that are environmental legal thrillers. Oh, okay. Uh, I didn't the, know that. Uh, the Appeal, Pelican Brief, and Gray's Mountain. Hmm. And okay. he, he never, to my knowledge, handled an environmental case. And as an environmental lawyer, you know, I read those and it's, I guess it's like a doctor watching a doctor show or a lawyer watching a lawyer <laughs> show. Yeah. And so man, are you, you're missing the boat on some of these right. things. And I, and I love Grisham. I think he's a great, great writer. I really enjoy mm -hmm. his writing. Um, but he misses the boat on some issues in the environmental arena. Yeah. Although he, he gets right more than he gets wrong. But mm -hmm. I figured, you know, what, what I could, um, what I could add to the uh, genre was the fact that I do have this environmental background and yeah. it's what I've done for 40 years. Mm -hmm. So I, I do have, um, that advantage. My, you had asked also about my earlier book, Drink sure. to Every Beast. Uh, and that uh, is sort of, it's the beginning of the series. Uh, the series follows a young uh, uh, DEP prosecutor named Mike Jacobs. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike in uh, Drink to Every Beast is uh, 26 years old. Okay. And, um, you know, he's really trying, he's involved in his very first big case, which mm -hmm. deals with uh, dumping of illegal and hazardous chemicals into the Susquehanna River. This story now is a year or so later, 
Mike is uh, involved in this big permit battle. Yeah. And so Mike is a character in the one story, the main character in the one story, he becomes the main character and protagonist in this story. And okay. fo do follow Mike through. There are a couple of other characters who are who were carried through, but I very intentionally wrote these books as standalone books. I, I didn't okay. want, I did not want people to be forced to read book number one to be able <laughs> to enjoy book number two. I was very careful about that. Yeah. And I think you pulled that off. I didn't get the sense that I was missing anything by not uh, having read Drink to Every Beast. Um, and yeah, going back to what you were saying about, um, I guess, how what you were thinking you had added the genre, how John Grisham gets more right than he gets wrong. But um, my wife is a nurse, actually. So anytime we were watching any kind of television show or they're in a hospital scene, she's like, that's not how you intubate somebody that right. is like, what is that machine over there? That it's not even a real thing. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So that's not how you put a ventilator on somebody. Um, so I imagine it's probably a similar situation with legal thrillers where, um, you know, there are a lot of details that, you know, if um, probably to a, a lay person who's reading it like myself, I probably would not know the difference if, you know, they did make some kind of misstep like that, but I'm sure it's probably frustrating for attorneys to read stuff like that when you know there are some mistakes so um i and i can i can see that in your writing too as i'm reading it it is so detailed and uh there are so many just the way I, that you write it and the jargon you use and the way that sentences are phrased i can tell that like you've actually been there and it does make a big difference to the reader too even though i am not as knowledgeable about you know how a court proceeding works or you know how a zoning battle might go um i can tell that this is more realistic than maybe some of the other uh, books I've read where there are legal scenes. It, it was important to me to get it right. And, mm -hmm. um, and also it's important to me to put the audience, the readers in the middle of the scene and for right. them to get a feel that, wow, I'm in the middle of all of this. Mm -hmm. So if I could just pick three quick examples, sure. one is mining, another is blasting and the third mm -hmm. is the courtroom scenes. So I've actually been in, the depths of quite a few uh, strip mines, both oh, coal wow. and as we call them here in Pennsylvania, non-coal mines. Just it goes to show you, by the way, how important coal has always been yeah. in Pennsylvania. There's coal and non-coal. So, wow. so I've been in, in <laughs> the bottom of both of those kinds of mines. Hmm. And, um, and I wanted people, I wanted the readers to get a sense of what's it really like. You know, often you hear it described as um, uh, it, it's like the surface of the moon. Well, it's really not like the surface okay. of the moon because it's different than the surface of the moon. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's a very, it, it really is a, a truly unique setting. And I wanted people to get a sense of the size of the equipment. There's a point where mm -hmm. Mike and the inspector are driving down uh, the hall road into the mine and a big piece of mining equipment drives by yeah. them. And Mike notices that the wheel is larger than the truck that he's in. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the feeling that you get. And you think to yourself, Oh my God, I could be crushed. Like yeah. nobody even notice. Yeah. And um, I just wanted people to get a sense. I wanted my readers to get a sense of what's it really like in a, in a coal mine. So there are mm -hmm. a number of coal mine scenes that take place. One at the beginning of the story and then a bunch of them later on. Mm -hmm. And I wanted readers to feel that. Another is um, blasting. Uh, yeah. Blasting plays a role in this case. And um, I was very fortunate because as an environmental lawyer, I got to do the environmental lawyer equivalent of a ride along. Okay. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, crime writers will, will get in with the cop, uh, the police department and the cops mm -hmm. will take them on a ride along and they get to sit in the back seat. Oh, okay. and they drive around with the police and they get a sense of what it's like to spend a day with huh. the officer. I did not know uh, that. When you're, when you're an environmental lawyer, what you do is you go out into the field with somebody mm -hmm. and it's a genuinely cool thing. So I spent a day uh, with a guy who's a licensed blaster. Mm -hmm. He took me to a uh, non-coal mine, as we call mm -hmm. it in Pennsylvania, <laughs> and uh, the he showed me exactly what happens when they're loading the borehole full of ANFO, which is ammonium nitrate and fuel oil. Okay. Uh, how they load it with ANFO and the work that they have to do and how difficult it is and how really how backbreaking the work is. It's very, very yeah. difficult, hard work. And it's mental. I mean, it really requires mm -hmm. a lot of expertise to be able to do it. And we were there. He, he um, ignited the blast. Uh, while I was there and I got to experience what that was like. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's a unique experience. And I was able to um, put some of that into the story. And then, um, and for those first two scenes, the mining scene and the blasting scene, mm 
Mm -hmm. Um, Not only did I write about it from my experiences, but I have friends and I maintain friends who are licensed blasters or who are miners or who are geologists Mm -hmm. who read those scenes and corrected me if I got something wrong, you know, and oh, they would okay. get back to me and they would say, hey, uh, we don't call it this, we call it that, or this is mm-hmm. not what would happen, or Here, here's how that would be set up. Because again, I wanted the readers to get a real genuine uh, experience of what mm-hmm. it was like doing these things. And then finally, the legal scenes. Um, there are a number of scenes. There's one towards the beginning of the story uh, where Mike is being very clever and is uh, getting the best of a, of a mine operator. Yeah. And uh, later on in the story, uh, there is a very uh, detailed account of a trial that takes place uh, with uh, Rhino Mining Company. Mm-hmm. And I, I sat down and I took out a legal pad and I wrote out questions exactly the way I would have written them out if I were the lawyer yeah. examining the witness. And I did that precisely the same way I would have done it. And then I tried to imagine what the responses would be. And I also know from my experience as a lawyer that no matter how well you plan, you know, the, the witness is going to go in a different direction. The witness is not going to answer the question. Yeah. The witness is going to um, uh, take it in a different direction. And then you've got to pull the witness back. And so I wanted, again, I wanted the readers to get a sense of what actually goes on in these proceedings. Now, I will mm-hmm. say that um, administrative law proceedings, environmental law proceedings tend to be dreadfully boring. And, uh, you know, so if there's anybody who's listening to this who's thinking, oh, I want to get into the exciting life of being an environmental lawyer, <laughs> yeah. understand that a lot of it is very, very technical, very, very detailed. And so I did enhance it a bit to make it a little bit more exciting and, mm-hmm. um, and make it a little more um, interesting for the readers. But I very much tried to make it as realistic as I possibly could. Yeah. So I, that was very important to me because both because I wanted to get it right and also because I wanted to I feel if you're reading a book, mm-hmm. one of the things you want to come away with is, boy, I feel like I was there. I feel like I was in right. Paris yeah. in World War II. I feel like I was in, you know, in the middle of this event that took place. I feel like I was in the middle of a mine or in the middle mm-hmm. of this trial. So, I mean, it's it's that was very important to me to do as a, as a writer. Yeah. In some ways, this kind of sounds like world building. I know, I know that, I mean, I guess technically it is world building, um, although, you know, might hesitate to call it that at first since it takes place in our own world but you know it's one of those things where if the details are right you don't really think about them a whole lot and you do get kind of immersed in the story but if they're wrong it kind of throws everything off and it can kind of you know mess up the whole tone of the book so um i definitely felt like it was very accurate i've never been um on a coal mine i actually don't even know what a coal mine looks like and or i didn't know what it looked like until i read your book so I thought that was pretty fascinating as well. And um, like you said, the visual details you provide, like the, I guess, providing the scale of the tractor wheel moving next to the car. I I mean, you see tractors when you're driving past construction sites and stuff, but you never actually realize how huge they are until you're right up next to them. Then I think there was also a scene where Mike and one of the inspectors were driving into a coal mine to go inspect it near the beginning of the book. And they actually nearly get run over by the tractor because I think the, um, don't actually know what you call it the excavator um is up and can't see the car right right yeah so i thought that was pretty cool i mean i just i again uh you know there's there's scale you know the the trucks Mm -hmm. that you see driving down the road you know the dump truck that you might see riding down the road which is sort of standard size that's meant for highway traffic Mm -hmm. then you've got the larger trucks that you might see at a construction site which are probably a a lot larger and then you go into a, a a strip mine and it's unbelievably large vehicles. I mean, it's, it's yeah. really hard to describe how large they are, although I tried to describe it. I mean, they are really and truly gigantic, massive vehicles. Mm-hmm. And it's it, they're really engineering marvels in the sense that, you know, something yeah. that big is able to, is able to operate, you know, and, and, and yeah. they do. And they're, you know, they're truly fascinating vehicles. I mean, mm. you know, anybody who played with toy trucks as a kid, you know, probably really <laughs> yeah, appreciates <me. laughs> Yeah, we have, um, I don't know of any coal mines that are near us, um, if we do have any at all, actually. I'm um, in the northern, like, metro Atlanta suburbs right now. But, um, you know, we do actually have a lot of granite and sand mines around here, I believe. So I've seen some of them, but from pretty far away. So I imagine up close, it's an entirely different experience. Um, so, yeah, that's, I liked how you added all those visual 
um, scale elements in the book that really helped the reader um, feel like they were in the place. Um, so I know that um, creating like an accurate representation of what it's like to be an environmental lawyer is one thing. And I do think that you um, keep it accurate while also keep it compelling. But is there anything else that you wanted the reader to take away from these books? Obviously, um, I feel like people become environmental lawyers for a reason because they're passionate about, um, you know, protecting the environment. Um, so is there anything like that that you wanted to communicate in your books beyond just creating a, I guess, a thrilling story? Yeah, um, certainly I wanted uh, to do several things. I wanted to educate readers and uh, let them learn about something that most people don't get to experience. Mm -hmm. That many people who've ever been in a, in a, coal mine or in a yeah. quarry or in some other kind of a mine. Exactly. And I really wanted people to uh, experience that. Likewise, um, most people other than lawyers and trial lawyers don't get to experience what it's like to be in a courtroom scene. And although mm -hmm. there are many, many um, legal thrillers out there, I mean, I, I thought I could add something to it and, um, and, and do my take on it. And I think, I think I handled that pretty well, to be honest yeah, with you. I do too. Um, the other thing is that in terms of climate change, you know, we often talk about the end result of climate change. In other words, the burning of the coal, which puts carbon into the air, which yes. has an impact on climate. And um, but there's the other side of it. So if you've mm -hmm. got the coal that's being burned and that's putting the carbon in the air, on the other hand, you also have the, um, the extraction of the coal yes. and the impact that that has. And the fact that um, the coal comes out of the ground, there's an impact in terms of doing the mining, mm -hmm. it's a very dangerous business. Um, uh, not too long ago in Pennsylvania, a miner uh, was killed in a deep mine um, when rocks fell on top of him. And, and uh -huh. that continues to happen. There's still, you know, several dozen, certainly yeah. dozens of injuries and certainly more than a handful of, unfortunately, a handful of deaths that occur in, in deep and strip mines every year. Yeah. And um, you've got the pollution aspects of it. Uh, today, I would say, um, the due to the highly regulated nature of mining industry, it's uh, less likely that there will be significant pollution occurring from modern mines. Mm -hmm. But certainly, if you go back just a few years, certainly a few decades, you're going to find a lot of pollution that occurred yeah. as a result of mining. And um, I was looking up the statistics uh, before we uh, met today. Mm -hmm. And um, what's really interesting is sad really is that um pennsylvania we have um something in the magnitude of um there it is uh 54,000 to 86,000 depending upon who you um ask uh miles of stream in pennsylvania mm -hmm. pennsylvania is listed as either the second or third um most stream miles uh, mm -hmm. after Alaska. Alaska is number oh. one. And Pennsylvania is either Not number two or three. <laughs> Huge number of stream miles. Oh. And in Pennsylvania, there are 2,400 miles that are polluted by uh, coal mining pollution. Oh my gosh. And, um, and that pollution, I'm going to say 99.9% .9 of it is probably pollution that occurred, you know, years ago. And that mm -hmm. will go on for as long as we're all alive because... Uh -huh. Uh, the mines are abandoned yeah. um, or they were inadequately uh, reclaimed. And as a result of that, you've got chemicals that go into the, uh, into the streams that kill the streams. Mm -hmm. You have something called acid mine drainage that goes into the stream okay. and will kill the stream. You can have sediment, you can have uh, you know, other pollutants that get into the stream. It really destroys the stream. So yeah. you know, if you've got 54,000 miles of, of uh, streams in Pennsylvania and 2,400 of them are polluted. That's 5% of the streams in Pennsylvania to this day are polluted by coal mining. That's so crazy. It, it, so there, you, you, it's, when you look at climate change, mm -hmm. it's, it's not just from the time of the burning until the carbon gets into the air, but there's what happened before the, the, the burning of the coal. Right. So I'm trying yeah. to educate people about that as well. I do talk mm -hmm. about climate change in my book, although this book is really more about what happens prior to the burning of the coal rather than right. afterwards. Although there's some discussion, I have a number of my characters talking about uh, climate change in the story. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot there. Um, yeah, and I feel like we are starting to hear a little bit more about the, um, I guess the before part 
not so much with mining of coal, but recently I've been hearing it more with mining of lithium for electric cars. And that's, I mean, I don't know if this is necessarily a more popular talking point for people who, you know, have something against electric cars or who don't want to see them become more widespread. But, you know, a very, very common criticism you hear of electric cars is, oh, they're not actually that environmentally friendly. There is a very dirty mining process that goes into extracting the lithium that you need to make lithium ion batteries, which power the cars. So, um, but you don't really hear that that much about coal. And maybe that's because coal is um, knock on wood starting to kind of go away a little bit more as a energy source in the United States. But I mean, just what you were mentioning there, I mean, you have like the impacts on the streams, which I know is a really big theme in your book, Amit Rage. Um, I think that's one of Mike Jacobs' big concerns is that um, in addition to the mine being in a residential area that where they are planning to build the mine is going to really badly pollute the stream that's nearby. But um, you also mentioned, you know, like worker fatalities, which is horrible. And, um, you know, you also hear about things like, um, I don't actually know the, the proper medical term for it, but um, I think black lung is uh, like the slang or the popular term for it. But so, I mean, coal mining is really dangerous and, has some pretty serious adverse health effects on workers. So I'm glad that you are showing more of that in the book. And a lot of this was news to me too. So, but I am curious. Um, I know you mentioned in Pennsylvania, you say like you have coal mines and you have non coal mines. Everybody knows Pennsylvania is a huge coal mining state. Um, what do you see as a future for Pennsylvania now that, um, coal is, like I was saying, becoming less of a fuel source um, for powering, you know, the grid. Yeah, I I actually looked up the statistics from the Mm -hmm. uh, Energy uh, Information Administration. So back in um, 2010, uh, coal accounted for 48% of the electricity in Pennsylvania. Wow. And natural gas accounted for uh, 15%. Mm-hmm. In 2019, the last year for which they had statistics, coal accounted for 17% of oh electricity gosh. generation, and natural gas was 43%. That's a so huge coal difference. is diminishing uh, year by year. Yeah. And part of the reason for that is it's, it's, it's expensive to get coal out of the ground. Uh-huh. Um, and um, one of the themes of my story is that Ernie Renati, the owner of this uh, mining company, mm-hmm. is trying to reduce the expense that he's facing. And that's one of the issues yeah. that takes place in the story is that he's very upset about these additional regulations and permit yep. requirements that will cost him money. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reality of it is that uh, probably the biggest impact today on both coal and also on uh, nuclear mm-hmm. is uh, natural gas. Natural gas has become incredibly cheap especially yeah. in Pennsylvania and in other states near yep. Pennsylvania. So as the price of natural gas has gone down, the use of natural gas as a fuel has gone up. Yep. It, was, it was used in the past for um, what they call utility scale energy generation, mm-hmm. uh, it, but not that much. Now it's used incredibly. I mean, if 43% yep. of electricity generation is uh, from natural gas in Pennsylvania, that's, that's a gigantic amount. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, it's due to the abundance of natural gas that we have in Pennsylvania. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very, very cheap. And that's cause that's, that probably is the single most factor that is causing coal to be diminished in Pennsylvania, as huh. well as nuclear. I mean, I live very close to a, um, a nuclear power plant that just closed down Three Mile Island. And TMI yeah. was the one where we had the, uh, the uh, you know, the accident that occurred back in 1979. <laughs> yes. And, um, you know, they wanted, even so, they had to close down half of the plant. Uh, so they closed down the one half that had the accident, and then they kept the other half open until this hmm. past year. Um, but the reason that they couldn't keep it going was that the cost of running the nuclear plant was too expensive. Yep. And part of the reason for that is that natural gas is, again, so cheap that it mm-hmm. was pushing uh, coal or pushing natural nuclear out as a, as a, um, as a, as a reasonably priced alternative for yeah. energy. So what we're seeing in Pennsylvania right now is this, um, is this uh, 
uh, switch over really mm. uh, to natural gas. Let me also say though, yeah, that we are seeing more and more renewables in the mix. Okay. I was but even ask about so, that. renewables account right now for about four percent of the energy in Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. So, uh, and renewables includes uh, wind and solar, of course. Mm -hmm. Also includes um, a small amount of uh, hydro and a few other uh, sources. Mm -hmm. But the main ones would be uh, wind and solar. Gotcha. And right now, actually, natural gas is also pricing them out of the market. Now, mm -hmm. at one time or another, all of these industries got a help, got some help right. uh, from the government. So, you know, when, when you see some... Um, uh, some people who support some of these other industries complaining about, you know, any kind of subsidies that mm -hmm. um, the renewable industry is getting. Keep in mind at one time, you know, the railroads, which were yep. really in, very, in a very big way, they became as big as they did because of the coal industry to transport coal uh -huh. from places like Pennsylvania, places like Ohio, places like Montana, yep. to places where they, the coal could be burned. That was subsidized hugely by the federal government. Mm -hmm. And um, the ability to even taking land, you know, land was transferred from the federal government uh, to mining companies and still is to this day. You know, mm -hmm. we're looking up at uh, the uh, Alaskan National yeah, uh, Wildlife Refuge. And you see them opening up these leases for ridiculous amounts, you know, pennies on the um, yeah. pennies for acres of land up in uh, Alaska uh, to drill for oil up there. Mm -hmm. So there's still an ongoing subsidy that takes place. So uh, no one should be uh, cowed by the fact that there are subsidies that are requested by the renewable industry. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how these industries all yeah. got their start at one time or another. And um, certainly when you look at the impact on uh on earth and impact on humans mm -hmm. it's much better uh to to um, promote these other industries and sure. at some point they will be fully profitable if they aren't already some of them are becoming yeah. uh, profitable on their own but you know there, there's in my opinion there's nothing wrong with a reasonable subsidy yeah i agree um and i, I do want to go back to natural gas in just a second but um i i feel like i was a little surprised to hear you saying that um natural gas is even pricing out some renewables in Pennsylvania, because I feel like I just keep seeing more and more articles about how cheap solar is now and how it's actually like really, really, really inexpensive to generate electricity through solar panels now. Um, but going back to natural gas, a lot of, um, I feel like this is kind of like a controversial subject right now. Um, you know, a lot of people are, I guess, kind of for natural gas, at least in a short amount of time, because they're saying, you know, it's a bridge fuel. It's going to help us um, wean ourselves off of fossil fuels, even though I guess natural gas is a fossil fuel. Um, it's going to help uh, uh, wean us off, you know, dirtier sources of electricity like coal. Um, but then on the other hand, you also have people saying, well, you know, burning natural gas produces methane, which is an even more potent greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide is and i feel like we're kind of walking a tightrope with that right now um especially looking forward to the incoming administration with um a biden presidency where um i believe natural gas is going to be part of his climate plan so i'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on that like how you think that plays into you know the transition to clean energy i think what you have to look at is um how does how do how does natural gas fit in the general scheme of things? Mm -hmm. I, I trust these fi figures from the Energy Information Administration. Sure. I don't think they're stilted for political reasons. Um, and when they say that forty three percent of uh, energy of electricity is generated by natural gas, and by the way, mm -hmm. uh, in Pennsylvania, fifty one percent of households are burning natural gas, so they're yeah. heated by natural gas as well. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a very, very huge amount. So you say to yourself, okay, if we were simply to say no more coal and no more natural gas, and it's going to mm -hmm. happen in six months, well, yeah, where are you going to get the energy? <laughs> I mean, that's, sure. I mean, that's a practical question. And, mm -hmm. and you can say, well, uh, you know, there's, um, you can certainly rely on renewables or you can rely on um, you know, being more energy efficient. And, yeah. and, and But those kinds of things are going to take a while. And I yeah. think that when you look at 
um, most everybody who, who writes on this, you know, the leading thinkers on this, they understand that there's going to be a transition phase. Yeah, there yeah. has to be a transition phase. But the other sure. thing too is, you look at in terms of what's better, what's worse. Now, I'm not a mm-hmm. I'm not a policy guru. I, I certainly don't yeah. have that. I don't know that that kind of stuff the way others do. But you look at it and you say, okay, coal mining has is is a very dirty fuel. Mm-hmm. Uh, it emits a lot of uh, of uh, particulates in the air. It emits uh, a lot of uh, carbon in the air, mm-hmm. and it has terrible effects so far as the mining process is concerned. Right. So if you look at that and you say, well, how how does natural gas fit in with respect to coal? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's 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 it is sort of an either or situation because yeah. it's it's going to be either one or the other. And what we're seeing is that as people are becoming more energy efficient, mm-hmm. as our society is becoming more energy efficient, and as coal is diminishing as a fuel in the United States, it is making a difference. But yeah. on the other hand, if you compare natural gas to um, nuclear, mm-hmm. and you know the environmental movement has had valid and just concerns about nuclear forever, you know, for 50 years. Yep. Um, But nuclear emits no carbon into the environment. (laughs) I know. I mean, it's, there's a lot, there are a lot of factors that go on there Mm -hmm. that you have to take into consideration. We're not even talking about burning oil. Yeah. I mean, oil is still used uh, in this day and age. It's either used in, in uh, motive, automotive, uh, you know, vehicles Mm -hmm. and it's used to uh, heat homes. Sure. A lot of homes still burn uh, heating oil for example. Okay. So, um, I mean, I think you have to look at all of these relative to the other. Yeah. You have to be realistic and you, you can't just simply say, well, we're going to go from 4% energy generation on renewables to, mm-hmm. you know, 60% generation in renewables. Right. We're going to do it in the next year or two. My hope is that it'll be done quickly. Sure. And ultimately we will be relying on renewables and not mm-hmm. on, uh, not on any of these, uh, you know, more dangerous substances, yeah. but there's, there's, it's going to take a while and mm-hmm. it's probably going to take longer than most advocates would like. Yeah. Gotcha. That's interesting. Um, yeah. Nuclear is it's kind of a weird one to talk about. Um, I was actually just um, in my day job. Uh, we have these talks. They're kind of like talks at Google if you um, are familiar with those, but basically like an employee can, read a book or choose a topic that they're interested in and do a presentation on it to the entire company. Kind of like a little mini Ted talk, I guess. Um, but one of my coworkers did a presentation on nuclear energy, which was really fascinating. And um, it is a very, very expensive way to generate electricity. But as you were saying, it is, uh, it doesn't produce any carbon emissions, at least in the actual uh, generation of the electricity. Um I mean, you have other things that go into that process, you know, like building the reactors and um, I believe it takes a tremendous amount of concrete to build, which uh, produces a lot of uh, greenhouse gases as well. But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm also, I'm always kind of wondering if that was a really big missed opportunity to produce more nuclear energy. And, you know, now we're having to rely on things like natural gas, which is a good thing that it's weaning us off of coal, but I'm kind of wondering if, you know, we would have been better served to have invested more heavily in nuclear in the past, even though it was pretty expensive. And I'm sure there's a lot of reasons why that didn't happen. I know that the uh, the fossil fuel industry in particular didn't really, or I guess they were concerned about competition from nuclear energy. And there was probably a little bit of lobbying that went on there in public relations campaigns. But yeah, it's a, that's a weird one. Well, nuclear is also dangerous. And yes, say, yeah. Um, I mean, you mentioned Three Mile the- Island. I mean, Three Mile Island, Island was uh-huh. the worst that we had in the United States, but in Japan, about 10 years ago, you had yeah, Fukushima accident. The Fukushima accident was terrible, and they still don't even know the extent of yep. what happened there because they can't get equipment in there, and it continues to this day to be a problem, and people uh-huh. are going to be affected by that for decades to come. And of yep. course, um, the accident that occurred in Ukraine um, yep. you know, a number of years ago. I mean, so there are many instances just showing how devastating you know, the, um, you know, an accident can be, I mean, let, mm-hmm. let's face it. If, if you have an awful accident at a gas drilling rig, or you have right. an awful accident at a coal mine or at a coal fired power plant, mm-hmm. that'll have an impact. And that impact, you know, could have long lasting effects, but nowhere near the effect of a meltdown yeah. of a, um, 
at a nuclear generating plant. Yeah. Nowhere near. And yeah. while it would be devastating and bad for the local environment, it's not going to have the same long-term effects of a meltdown. And, mm-hmm. and we've seen, it's not like a theoretical thing. We've seen now yeah. a yeah. number of them that have occurred that the public's even aware of. I'm sure there are others that we're not quite as aware of, but certainly a number of them too that, that mm-hmm. exist. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I think that's also what it always comes down to is the safety of it. Um, whether it is, you know, as I don't know how to put this necessarily, whether it's like as dangerous on like a daily basis as coal mining um, might be one thing. It's probably safer on a daily basis. But when an accident happens, it is very, very, very bad to put it mildly. So, um, yeah, but I guess um going back a little bit to how you're talking about, you know, like how Pennsylvania has so many streams and how in the book Amid Rage, uh, a big concern is pollution of the streams um, at the construction site or excuse me, at the mining site that's been proposed. A big thing I've been hearing about lately, and this is not a new idea by any means, but I guess an, an interesting concept I've heard a lot about is legal rights for nature or for the environment. Um, I was wondering if that ever crossed your mind when you're writing this book or if you had any opinions on that or yeah, just wanted to hear your thoughts about that topic. It's not a new idea. Um, sure. Back in 1972, um, the uh, um, there was an article that was written in the um, University of uh, Southern California Law Review mm-hmm. by an author named... Um, Christopher Stone, and he's a, he was a law professor at the time, and he wrote an article called Should Trees Have Standing? Yeah. And the um, article was picked up uh, literally days or weeks later uh, by Justice uh, Douglas, mm-hmm. uh, who uh, was an interesting uh, Supreme Court justice in his own right, but William O. Douglas picked it up, and he actually turned it largely into a, a dissent in hmm. the famous Sierra Club v. Morton case, okay. dealing with uh, the um, potential um, development of a very pristine uh, uh, valley in the uh, Sierra Nevada mountains. Hmm. And uh, so the issue, and, and the point that he made, which is sort of a very interesting point, he says, uh, it's not like only humans have legal standing. Now, legal standing, you yeah. understand, is the ability to go into court and to raise an issue. And we've heard that even recently in the recent uh, litigation that's taken place uh, over um, the election, whether or not whoever it was that was filing suit had legal standing. So standing is a very important concept because if you don't have legal standing, then you don't have the right to to bring suit. Mm -hmm. And um, what Douglas pointed out in his dissent was that, um, that corporations, which are not human beings, have standing and corporations can... They're considered people under the law Mm -hmm. for standing purposes. And he also points out that in Admiralty, ships have standing. Okay. So a a vessel itself has standing to bring suit or to be sued. So uh, in terms of of standing and in terms of whether a thing is an object Mm -hmm. versus a human being, you know, the the precedent is already out there. Douglas said in his dissent, uh, the precedent's already out there so that it's not absolutely necessary that you have to be a human being who's been affected. Yeah. If you could, if you, in his more fanciful uh, jargon, if, if a tree <laughs> could have, if a human could have standing because the human is impacted by some activity, mm-hmm. and why not a tree, which is going to likewise be affected? Now, yeah. what happened in Sierra Club v. Morton was very an interesting case because the case was actually uh, thrown out by the Supreme Court uh, because the um, uh, Sierra Club intentionally did not raise the question of whether any humans were affected. So they went back and they uh-huh. revised their um, complaint and, and indicated that humans were affected. And as a result of that case, ultimately, it made the uh, legal point that you didn't have to actually live in an area. You didn't actually have to own property in an area. But if you used an area, so if you, mm-hmm. uh, Forrest, as a hiker, you know, yeah. use a particular um national forest area Mm -hmm. as a hiker or as a hunter or as a fisher person or whatever yeah then um uh that was enough to prove to make standing so it did it Mm. did ultimately have that that beneficial effect but you know it's so it's been around for a long time okay 72 is almost 60 years now yeah uh, since um since that case came out 
Awesome. And so it's, it's an issue that gets talked about from time to time. My personal belief is that the courts are not likely to go that far. Yeah. Um, but I think that they will say that they've already said in the Sierra Club v. Morton case that if you as a, as a human, as a person, can show that you have been affected by the potential development, mm-hmm. then that gives you the basis to have standing. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I was curious about, um, I guess, how that would work from a standing point of view. Um, because, you know, I was thinking like, oh, well, it sounds like it would be great if we did, um, I guess I use the word assign legal rights to nature. Uh, I guess technically that's the way that would work, but it feels a little silly to say that we're assigning rights to something. Um, but how would, I mean, a tree is not going to file a lawsuit to use a silly example, but how would, you know, the process of getting a lawsuit started or litigation started happen in that case? I think um, one of the, the things I was thinking back to when I was um, preparing this question was in the book, there is kind of a community organizing aspect to pushing back against the zoning permit that Rhino Mining has obtained to build this strip mine in their neighborhood, essentially. Um, might that be one avenue for people to, I guess, raise a legal issue about nature's rights? I would say that the way it would probably come up would be through a trustee, okay, uh, in this a human trustee who would bring the bring a suit. Uh, and the best example I can come up with is that typically minors mm-hmm. are not considered uh, fully people, so far as the law is concerned. Oh my gosh! And often, when a minor has to bring suit for whatever reason, mm-hmm. there is a guardian or a trustee who would bring the suit on behalf of the minor. Yeah, and perhaps you know just you know, puzzling this out with you, perhaps the way it would work <laughs> is that a trustee or a guardian yeah. uh, would bring suit. In Pennsylvania, uh, we have a very strong amendment to uh, the Pennsylvania Constitution, the Environmental Rights Amendment, mm-hmm. and it does talk in terms of trustees. And so there's still, um, although the amendment uh, was passed in the 70s, 1970s, mm-hmm. um, the, uh, it was never acted on until very recently, like in the past five or six years. Mm-hmm. And so the courts are still um, trying to figure out the full meaning of the Environmental Rights Amendment. And how are suits brought under the Environmental Rights Amendment? So that's, yeah. I would expect that you'd do it under a trustee or a guardian, that kind of situation. Okay. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you mentioned that um, minors don't necessarily always have full representation as a person. What exactly does that mean? Well, typically a minor uh, person under the age of 18 can't, Mm -hmm. you know, can't bring suit. I mean, oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood you. I thought you meant minor as in a coal miner. Oh, coal miner. No, no. I mean, like a, (laughs) like a three-year-old. Yeah. A three-year-old is not, a three-year-old may be, you know, adversely affected by something, but a three-year-old can't bring a lawsuit. So typically a guardian would bring the suit on behalf of the three-year-old. That makes a lot more sense. Okay. (laughs) M-I-N-E-R, but M-I-N-O-R. I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize things were that bad. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh, that's funny. Um, Okay, yeah, I had, I guess, another question about, well, all these questions really are about how um, the law and environmentalism intersect, but um, I feel like the law is going to be a very important piece of combating climate change. And, um, you know, we have situations where like, Massachusetts has, I believe they sued Exxon Mobil for essentially deceiving stakeholders or excuse me, shareholders about the effects that burning fossil fuels could have um, and worsening climate change. Um, I guess, what do you think your role uh, or how do you see the role of law in um, mitigating climate change? And is there anything that your books do to talk about that? Um. I think ultimately the, um, uh, I mean, the courts are going to be dealing with a number of issues relating to climate change. Mm-hmm. There have now been quite a few lawsuits that have been brought. Um, some of them have been brought by attorneys general across mm-hmm. the United States against energy companies. Uh, some have been brought by uh, individuals um, on behalf of uh, you know, their own personal rights. Some have been brought by one state against another. If you're yeah. a downwind state, if you're, let's say, Massachusetts, and you're downwind from uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio, mm-hmm. Massachusetts could bring suit against Pennsylvania 
okay. um, because of uh, the impact of climate change, because the impact of all this particulate and other um, other uh, emissions that go into the air that 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 have an impact on on Massachusetts. Hmm. So um, I, I think that we're going to see more litigation uh, for a long time to come in that yeah. area. Uh, I don't think it's going to go away, and certainly I think. Um, uh, with the change of administrations, I think we're going to see a much more mm-hmm. favorable approach in Washington so far as climate change is concerned. It's got to be favorable. Yeah. And, uh, uh, President-elect Biden has said very specifically he plans to re-enter the Paris Accords, thankfully. Mm-hmm. And um, I think we're going to see that happening. We're going to see other, uh, the, the people that he's starting to select are people who are not climate change deniers. So I think we're going to start seeing a, start. a lot of, um, <laughs> a lot more, uh, a lot more favorable uh, approach toward protection of yeah. the environment and also uh, making an impact on climate change. Let's hope so. I certainly hope so. I don't know if you want to read a section from your book or not, but if you do, I just going to see if you wanted to do that around now, or we can do some more questions, whatever you're feeling like. Um, I'd be happy to read from the book. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me, uh, just give me a second here and I'll pull it up. Okay. Like I said, unfortunately, I, I'm, I can't read my own book, so I've got to read it mm. on the screen. Okay. But here we go. I do have it. I think I'm the only person right now who has it on Kindle, but a- after February <laughs> 2, everybody can get it on Kindle. Cool. Yeah. I, I can't remember what I, I think I had to, I think I've been reading it on iBooks maybe is the name of the app, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. It is available um, to reviewers and people like sure, yourself sure. Yeah. Uh, that's been put up there by my um, publisher. Yeah. And, uh, okay. but for the rest of the world, it'll be available on February 2, both paperback okay. and uh, ebook. Cool. Awesome. So this is actually um, chapter one. So I'm just going to start reading. Okay, please. Mike Jacobs white knuckled the overhead hand grip in the DEP Jeep as it bounced across the floor of the strip mine. It felt like they were driving over logs one after the other fast. The mine inspector, Chris Markley, chatted away as if he was cruising down the smoothest, straightest six lane highway. He swerved to avoid a boulder that easily would have taken out the undercarriage. Mike swallowed hard to keep his breakfast down. Hey, Chris, maybe if we slow down a bit, we can spend a little time enjoying the scenery. Mike now had his left hand on the dashboard in front of him, in addition to holding on to the overhead grip. He attempted a smile. They drove past the sign with the DEP logo on it. Mines and quarries are not playgrounds. Stay out. Stay alive. Where's the fun in that, Chris? took his eyes off the narrow two-rut hall road uh, to look at Mike. The white jeep from the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection uh, bounced from rut to rut, kicking up rocks and dirt. Mike wished Chris would keep his eyes on the trail. The floor of the mine was covered with boulders and loose rock. The hall road wasn't much better, but at least it had the semblance of a trail. He tried to focus on distant points to keep from getting sick. He often heard people say that a coal strip mine resembled the surface of the moon. Hardly. This Mm -hmm. mine, Black Diamond Anthracite's Gilberton Mine, was part of old abandoned, part old abandoned mine and part new workings. The abandoned part had a gray and black floor made up of waste coal and rocky overburden, scrubby little birch trees and other vegetation that tolerated acidic environment, struggled to survive in the hostile landscape. Water pooled in depressions and turned into acidic mine water where it stood. Any that managed to make it off the mine site was hopelessly contaminated with acid, sulfur, manganese, and other metals that poisoned streams and made the water undrinkable. They drove past an abandoned car that had been set on fire. All that was left was a rusted hull. I want to make an impression with these guys, so we have to get there to the high wall before the boys here have a chance to clean it up too much. We entered the mine 10 minutes ago, and you just know they're busy tidying up the mess from last night. The mess was the aftermath of a mishap with explosives. Blasting typically was done when the shift was on break or at the end of the day. Boreholes were drilled into the rock, loaded with a mixture of ammonium nitrate and fuel oil, ANFO, and then blasted. This high wall had a blowout during blasting the afternoon before and sprayed fly rock about a thousand feet onto the pit floor. Not a huge problem here since the rock didn't leave the mine and no one was hurt, but a violation nevertheless. In a more populated area, an incident like this could have been deadly. Chris would write it up and Mike probably would have to enforce any order he issued. I want to impress these guys with the fact that I brought my lawyer with me. Chris forced a wide smile at Mike and raised and lowered his eyebrows, Groucho style. 
Mike liked Chris. He was typical of the new inspectors at DEP. He was young, in his late 20s like Mike, with a degree in environmental science. He was also a fisherman and hunter and was aggressive about enforcing the law. Mike, an assistant counsel in DEP's litigation and enforcement division, did all he could to support guys like Chris. What can you tell me about them, Mike said as he tried to distract himself from the constant rumbling in his stomach. Not too often, awful. These guys have a couple of strippings all in Schuylkill County, like this one, nothing underground, maybe five, 10 men at each site, a couple of violations a year, nothing terrible. The foreman for this mine, Kevin Schultz is an asshole. Me and Schultz, never see eye to eye. He won't be too happy to see us. And you heard about the Fly Rock incident, how? Mike eased his grip on the overhead as the hall road flattened out. The only thing better than a disgruntled former employee is a disgruntled current employee. Got a call on my cell last night and called you right away. I'm glad you were available to come up here first thing this morning. They drove past a line of derelict mining equipment, standing alongside one another, like in some kind of apocalyptic movie parking lot. They had been ravaged for their spare parts, their bodies turned into rust and their guts spilling onto the mining floor. Mike wondered if there were any DEP Jeeps among the junkers. The Jeep rounded an unmined outcrop. Right in front of them, no more than 50 feet away, was a D10 dozer, yellow, covered with dirt and coal dust, billowing diesel smoke from its single stack. Not the biggest dozer on the market, but significantly bigger than the Jeep. Right in the middle of the hall road, huge yellow blade at eye level, coming straight at them, fast. Chris stomped on the brake. The outcrop they were driving around prevented them from veering to the left. Huge boulders and junk trucks prevented them from turning to the right. The Jeep skidded to a stop, sliding sideways like it was on ice. The dozer kept coming. Hold on. Chris popped the Jeep into reverse, and Mike looked over his shoulder. Directly behind them was a gigantic Deer 944 front-end loader, bucket at window height, bearing down on them. They were trapped. Oh, crap. Chris stomped on the brake, and the Jeep skidded backwards as the loader closed in on them from behind and the dozer from in front. Ambushed, they'd be sandwiched between the two gigantic machines, crushed, decapitated by those blades, death in front and behind. Mike had to find a way out. There, he pointed. The outcrop had an opening, hard to, hard to the left, a few inches wider than the Jeep. Chris stepped on the gas, and they fishtailed into the narrow opening just as the loader flew by. He stomped on the brake again at the end of the narrow pass, and the clash of steel on steel crashing together behind them sounded like two locomotives in a head-on collision. Mike and Chris said nothing for several seconds, Chris's hands still on the wheel, knuckles white from the tension. The Jeep idled in the small hollow of the rock. The exhaust rose in the cold morning air. What the hell, Mike said. They climbed out and had no more than six inches of on either side until they hit rock. Mike squeezed past the sides of the Jeep. His, his back caught on the rock wall and in front of his jacket slid along the vehicle. Mike and Chris slowly approached the one opening in the rock. The dozer and loader were gunning their engines and the beep, beep, beep of reverse gears pierced through the growling noise. Mike poked his head out from within the outcrop. In a flash, he saw a single a yellow smudge in the corner of his eye and heard the growl of the engine. His hand flew to Chris and he pulled him back as the loader sped by them, inches away. Mike was shocked. Instead of a deadly crash, the dozer was backing away as fast as it had approached. The loader made a wide U-turn around the junk trucks and headed back toward them. Mike and Chris looked at each other. What the hell, said Mike. The loader regained the trail and pulled up next to them. Hey, Chris, morning, said the driver through an open window, as though he stopped to chat on his way to the convenience store for a bag of chips. Yo, Schultze, you asshole, you almost killed us. Chris shook his fist angrily at the foreman. Schultze laughed a hearty laugh. Hey, boys, couldn't see you over the blade of that in that little Jeep. A mine's a dangerous place. You know what the sign says, stay out, stay alive. You come onto a mine anywheres and you have to be careful. This is our turf. Be a little more careful next time. Watch yourselves. Schultze laughed heartily and gunned the motor. The loader rumbled down the hall road. The bucket wasn't even dented. Two hours later, Mike sat in his car scrolling through his emails. Junk mail, circular from DEP benefits office, nothing important. Then an email from Roger Alden, his boss. Mike, are you done playing yet in Gilberton? Don't you have a trial day after tomorrow you should be getting ready for? New case just came in. Ever hear of Rhino Mining? Out West, Somerset County. See me as soon as the trial is done. Thanks, Roger. Awesome. Thank you very much, Joel. That was uh, chapter one from a mid-range, right? Yes. Cool. Yeah, and I think that was the scene that I was referencing earlier with a 
tractor and really running them over in the Jeep. So <laughs> that was quite a, a mental image. Um, yeah, following up on that, um, one thought I had when I was reading the first chapter, actually, I know that the book is it's about this legal battle between the owner of this mining company, Rhino Mining, and Mike Jacobs, who works for the state of Pennsylvania, um, and Renati, the owner of the mining company, Rhino Mining, he's just an asshole, <laughs> and uh, I think you do a pretty good job of conveying that. And he's just a really slimy dude. But um, I'm curious. I um, I don't necessarily think that you were trying to, you know, paint the entire industry in that light by any means. But I was wondering um, about maybe some of the good people who work in mining. And um, I, I mean, obviously, you mentioned in the book, too, that there are plenty of mines that, you know, do abide by the regulations. And, you know, they just see it as part of doing the job and they don't really cause any trouble but then there are these you know people like ernie renati who do cause a lot of trouble and um do things like hopefully i'm not spoiling anything but you know kill inspectors and stuff like that so i don't know if you have any thoughts on i guess the good actors in the mining industry and let me be really clear about it mm -hmm. the vast majority of people in the mining industry are good people yeah uh, they're working at a very highly regulated in a very highly regulated industry uh, they believe that uh, that um, mining is a very good thing to do uh, in general. Mm -hmm. uh, they they think that uh, what they're doing is they're providing a very valuable resource, coal, yeah. that does several things for all of us. It provides electricity. Uh, it provides a, a huge um, uh, product that gets sold around the world mm -hmm. and that helps our economy. And it provides jobs, and, uh, and yeah. today it can be done very safely. So mm -hmm. the vast majority of them are doing that, and I say that in the, in the book as well. Yeah. Although of course you the do. story focuses on uh, Rhino Mining Company, mm -hmm. which I describe as the worst company in Pennsylvania. <laughs> and there's you know there's always got to be a, a best company and a worst company. Yeah, so we're, exactly. We're, it wouldn't be any fun if I wrote a story about a company that complied with all the regulations and that, <laughs> you know did everything it was supposed to do and had yeah, of course involved in it. Yeah. So this is about the other end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of people who work in the mining industry are very hardworking people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a very very tough industry. Yeah, and um, it's 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 not it's not the kind of work that most people would want to do because it is so 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 difficult and dangerous and uncomfortable. I mean, mm -hmm. they work you know they work uh, in January, February, March when there can be snow on the ground and, and yeah. when it's uh, five degrees outside they're working. And uh, they work when it's 100 degrees outside. So it's, yep. it's a very uh, difficult job that, that probably not too many people uh, could do. Mm -hmm. So um, the other thing, too, is um, like so many other industries, it's a very highly regulated industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are many, many regulations on the books that they have to comply with. I mean, everything from uh, how big their sign has to be in front and what has to be on the sign to mm. how they how they isolate the various uh, the, the topsoil from the subsoil from the acid bearing rock you know very complicated and tricky things that they have to do how mm. they have to in the permitting process uh, avoid uh, streams and certainly avoid perennial and intermittent streams and I mean these are all very complicated highly regulated things that they do yeah. so it's, it is a very highly regulated industry like so many other industries Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's not an easy industry. The question is whether yeah. on balance in this day and age, whether on balance that industry um, uh, should continue yeah. uh, when you consider the impact uh, both to the environment where the mining is taking place as well as in terms of climate change. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you said that. And I guess part of my reason in asking that question was to highlight the point that in your book you do take care to mention that not every mining company is a bad company um like you said in every industry there are good and bad actors and perhaps some industries are are uh the proportion of bad actors to good actors might be a little bit higher than in others but or maybe you just hear about it more but um i guess part of the reason i was also asking the question is because um you hear a lot about especially in perhaps more like um progressive circles about the need for um, a just transition to clean energy economy. And 
I know that a lot of um, the proponents for a Green New Deal, that is a pretty central component to what they're trying to accomplish with a Green New Deal. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on what a just transition might look like and what that really means. Well, it's, it's, it's not an, there, there's not an easy answer to that question. I mean, you okay. can certainly say tomorrow we're going to stop using coal. You could say <laughs> yeah. that. But where are you going to make up the, um, the loss of that electricity? Where, mm-hmm. where does that come from? It, you know, there's going to have to be a transition yeah. until you get to a point where you're not relying on coal or oil or even natural gas. I mean, that, mm-hmm. there's a transition that's going to have to take place. And it's, and it's not just simply a question of saying, well, uh, it's going to take us this long to retrain these, these workers so that they can be doing something else. It's, yeah. it's where, how are you going to make up the energy? I'm, I'm not smart enough to figure out how we make up the energy. <laughs> sure. I just don't know. I mean, yeah. how, do, how do you make up the energy loss that's going to take place? Mm-hmm. Not to mention, how do you make up the jobs? How do you avoid uh, devastating the economy of these yeah. areas? But yeah. I think that um, in terms of energy use in the United States, I mean, I'd love to see us relying on um, on renewables more, mm-hmm. and getting away from um, uh, uh, substances like coal and oil and natural gas that have an impact on mm-hmm. climate change and on the climate. But you know, there's going to be a time frame that that's going to have to take place. If you look at the, um, uh, the international uh, UN uh, climate change commission, yes, um, I mean they talk in terms of years and years till we can get to the point of being able to you know completely go away from coal. But keep in yeah. mind, um, England, which used to rely very heavily exclusively on coal at one point for its mm-hmm. energy production, yep. now doesn't rely on it at all. I mean they've yeah. completely gone away. Now on the other Pretty hand, huge. they rely on nuclear. Yes. So they have, I believe, uh, eight nuclear power plants that power uh, all of the energy needs for uh, for the UK. Yeah. And the same thing with uh, Germany and some other countries where they've pretty much gotten away from uh, coal. So, yeah. um, you know, they've been able it's it's doable. It is very much mm-hmm. doable, but there has to be a lot of um, of uh, desire to get it done and there has to be political will to get it done. Yeah. And we're seeing right now people listening to this later on this is being recorded in early january 2021 Mm -hmm. we're seeing right now that there are some who have a lot of political will and a lot of you know political courage and that there are others who don't seem to have a whole lot of political courage yeah but it's going to require a lot of political courage and Mm -hmm. um, it's going to have to it's going to also require um uh the will of people to get it done i mean people are going to have to be willing to um do things a little differently as we transition away from Mm -hmm. fossil fuels. Yeah, not an easy task to be sure. And if it was, we probably would have already figured out how to do it by now. Right. So yeah, cool. Well, Joel, I think that's all the time we have today. I really appreciate you coming on the show and reading for us and sharing all your insight and your immense wealth of knowledge from 40 years being an environmental lawyer. So a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. And Forrest, thank you very much. And thanks for the opportunity. And um, like I said, the, the book of Mid-Rage comes out on uh, February 2, and it'll be available both in paperback and electronic version. I encourage everybody to buy it at your local bookstore yeah. and uh, secondarily to get it on Amazon. Um, but uh, <laughs> please, uh, I look forward to um, everybody having an opportunity to enjoy it and learn something from it. Because I really, yep. really do want people both to enjoy it and learn something from it. Mm-hmm. And I can attest to that myself. I've uh, Joel was Joel's publisher was gracious enough to provide me with an advanced copy, and I can attest to the fact that it is a great book, and I think everybody should read it. So, Joel, thanks again for coming on the show. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Forrest. You too. Thank you. Right.